think I want to start with that interesting question about what do I wish I had known when I was 20 years old. I was expecting to look at a room full of people that age, but actually I've got quite a diversity of ages here. But I'll talk maybe a little bit to the younger people in the room. Uh, so when I was 20 years old, it was 1982, and I was in a, a, a small liberal arts college in Southern California, which was designed to look like a beautiful little college in New England, except that it was 40 degrees most days, and the smog was so appalling that you couldn't see the mountains. That were, just, that were less than 10 k's away. So already, the moment I arrived, there was this sense of denial, right, that was fundamental to the experience of the college. We are in a New England liberal arts college, except that it's 40 degrees. And we're expected on some level to dress that way. And we're expected on some level to comport ourselves that way. And we're expected to, to, to not have any complaints about the fact that they continue pouring upholing amounts of water that Southern California doesn't have on these gardens whose purpose is to make us believe that we're in a college in New England, or better yet still, older. <laughs> Meanwhile, in 1982, we had just elected a president by the name of Ronald Reagan, uh, whom I must acknowledge, although I certainly didn't support him, did lead us out of the Cold War. But in 1982, his way of doing that was to give us the impression that we were all about to die. <laughs> the Cold War was our equivalent of climate change. The difference between what my generation experienced and what yours experiences with the threat of climate change is that we felt completely helpless and it could happen tomorrow. So I want you to feel you have a little more time. <laughs> um, and so I was always aware that as I went into all the rituals of my education and the courses and the professors who needed to be pleased and, and the various processes that you needed to satisfy and the dot, dots you needed to take, that this whole thing seemed like a bit of a fantasy. That it, this couldn't be what was the reality of what was real. Now, there are a whole bunch of other reasons to feel that. Obviously, you, you, you know, all of the other things that are going on in terms of sexual energy and so on, that's part of being the undergraduate. Hey, but this larger sense that it's all just not quite right and I'm sort of acting something out here that I'm not sure I completely believe. And what I wish somebody had told me when I was 20 years old is that that means you've got it right. <laughs> that means you've figured it out. All through your life, and especially as you go on in any kind of career, you're going to encounter systems. Systems set up by your parents' generation, or their parents' generation. One of the things about studying Shakespeare, you know, is that you get back into these medieval history plays, and you see the absurdity of what happens when everybody acts just like their parents. <laughs> and the same kind of monstrous values get propagated from generation to generation for centuries. Right? So, I can't say too much that this sense that you must, that if you have a sense that what your parents are bequeathing you with the best of intentions, however much you may love them, is not quite what you want. If you have a sense that the processes that you're currently going through to achieve whatever sort of, of, of degrees or recognition you currently want to have that to lead to whatever sort of career you think you're going to have, if you have a sense that this can't really necessarily be everything, you're doing it right. And I wish somebody had told me that when I was born. Because I was very alone in that sensation at that time. So let's start with a reality about transport planning in general. This is about the world your parents and grandparents built, the system of values that they built in the best of intentions. And I completely understand it. One of the things this system requires is an ability to predict behavior 20 and 30 years into the future. We call it modeling. <laughs> and because it comes out of a computer, it solves all kinds of political problems. 
When the computer tells us something, that means we don't have to think. And I cannot tell you how many times I have laid out a particular idea for how something might work in 2030. And the modeler at the table has said, that's interesting, we'll have to see how it does. <laughs> and what he means is what the computer thinks. He doesn't know about 2030 yet. So let me, just, let me give you this little bit of wisdom about transport and about so much of what goes into building the urban environment and so much of what's going to go into building the urban environment that your children live in. The fundamental contention of all of these systems that claim to predict the future 20 or 30 years in advance, and they are everywhere in almost every project we do, 2030 patronage projections, 2035 modeling of traffic demand, 2035 uh, um, uh, enumerations of pedestrian volumes at a particular place, 2035 economic projections. These things have powerful impacts on the decisions people make today because they came out of computers and it's easier than thinking, frankly. And it's easier than having a conversation about what you want if you have a computer telling you what the facts were. But what all of those models depend on as the absolute bedrock of their certainty is that when you are the same age that your parents are now, you will behave exactly <coughs> the way they do. <laughs> that is what we're counting on for all those models to be right. That's what we're assuming, after all, because we base these models on what your parents did last year, right? And that's our basis for concluding what you're going to do 20 or 30 years from now when you're there. Right? But here's the interesting thing. One of the very most brilliant ideas of life was that each one of us is genetically unique, although we are made up of the material of our parents. It is our difference from our parents that is the art of evolution. And likewise, it is the difference, it is your conscious differences from your parents that are the art of history. And if you've spent as many years as I have doing a PhD in theater, reading about the medieval era when nobody seemed to learn anything from the monstrous lives of their parents, and everyone just kept propagating the same, the same society and the same cruelty and the same violence over and over and over again, it's that progress and civilization arise from people disagreeing with their parents. <laughs> And I say this from a particular perspective because my parents had beautiful values. They were actually young hippies. <laughs> I was born in 1962, so these were some of the original hippies, not all of the, der the derivatives that you've seen. This was when it was really happening. The Beatles were new, and Joni Mitchell, and all that. It was just raw. Um, my mother went off in a VW bus to go to San Francisco in 1967 for the summer of love. That, that was the real time. And what you say? And she came back. And that's how I became so square. That's part of how I'm different from my parents. I'm very square and rational. And I just wrote this absurdly readable, human, humane, I think, and yet patiently rational book about the fact that I much, much as I love the fact that, as Pippa said, people should come to public transport from all different kinds of perspectives, there are a few facts of geometry about it. And a lot of people who are out there opining about public transport haven't bothered to stop and think about this stuff. And what I did in my book was, to, uh, be, was precisely because I wanted to give a lot of different people the power to contribute their own values and their own experience to thinking about public transport. I wanted people to have a nice, quiet place where without embarrassing themselves in front of anyone else, they could go off and in the privacy of their own home, discover the five or six little facts of geometry, some of which are counterintuitive. They're not obvious. But those five or six little facts of geometry that will help you not make catastrophic stupid mistakes. There's a, and, and, and that's what I've been able to offer, and that increasingly is what my work is about. 
Because fundamentally, what I'm trying to do with public transport is liberal. When I, what I am trying to do with public transport, wherever I work, is to create networks that enlarge people's sense of freedom to access their city, the freedom to engage with more different people. The reason you might want to live in Remuera instead of just is precisely that this is a real city and that you can be part of something larger um, and, and that all of this is available. And that requires public transport because we can't, we don't have room for all the driver. So I'm very focused on that, and I'm focused on that because the beauty and the art. Here's the argument, and I'll wrap up with this. Here's the argument I'm always having with the urban designers and architects who come at this with the best of intentions, and they give us little drawings of beautiful little spaces, and they draw little pastel people in them who are doing exactly what the architect wants them to do. <laughs> right. And I want them to sort of surprise me. And I want to create, I want to, to encourage the creation of cities where people will surprise us. Because that process of surprising us is history. And so, yes, if you feel like you, if, even if you're doing really well in the process you have, and I was a very good student, I was very good at pleasing professors, I was very good at, at getting the papers written. I got lots of good grades, and at the same time, over here, I was aware that the whole process seemed absurd. Somewhere. And if you can get to that sensation, you've got it right. Thanks.